Hello, everyone, and welcome to Taunt Talks. And today I am joined by the illustrious Mr. Jim Davis of Real DM. And we are talking about how to not only create your own monsters, create your own spells in DD, but how to add them to DD Beyond as well. And we're going to, we're mixing it up. We're going to let yeah. Jim Davis do the driving on all of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm happy to have uh, successfully performed my coup uh, over Todd Talks. <laughs> I, I will institute a regime of benevolent home brewing. <laughs> <laughs> As well, you should, sir. There'll right. be lots of paintings of uh -huh. Jim Davis everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Yep. We're going to do a dance every morning. It's going to be great. The Jim Davis dance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, good. <laughs> calisthenics are important. <laughs> very much, very much. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about this because one of the things I love about Dungeons and Dragons is the ability to create your own stuff. Like playing with the base monsters, playing with the the other you know, stuff that's in the PHB and the monster manual and everything is fun. It's a great way to like get a feel for how the game works. But you can I mean, you, first time DM you can just make it all up if you want. <laughs> and I love the fact that that's always a possibility. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. There's a lot of different variations on how you can modify monsters, create your own. And uh, I can't wait to start talking about all those. So uh, do you just want to jump right into it or? Uh, yeah, let's what? jump right into it. Let's start. Um, uh, let's go ahead and start with monsters. We're going to show yes. you how to not only design your own monsters, but also how to add them to D&D Beyond. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of the monsters, one of the things that I like to keep in mind is that 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons is an exceptions-based rule system. And that just means that there's this blanket foundation of rules, right? The, you know, you can just assume that the game works a certain way unless a rule contradicts it and is therefore an exception. It's so like once you can wrap your head around to that, the whole your whole imagination is is open to what you can do, right? All you have to do is say, you know, this thing every time it uh, you know reaches zero hit points, this is what happens, or you know whatever. Really, really it's kind of hard to give examples because it could be anything, um, and so. One of the things that I like to keep in mind when I'm making monsters, especially like my own monsters, is that the whole rule book is open and it's not just combat, it's not just defenses. You can easily take any portion of it and, and modify it slightly, make a change to it to produce something. You know, do you want your attack to do more than damage? Uh, then you can put that onto an insane attack. If you wanted to do something that's not a condition, like for instance, I don't know, an attack requires that the target now has to consume twice as much food and water as they normally would. You, you just write that in. Yeah. And so it's a really fun way to like surprise your players and, and sort of like elicit a, oh my God, what was that <laughs> uh, kind of reaction from them? Because they're used to just damage and the conditions. But if you all of a sudden go, well, you have to eat dirt instead of drink water now. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, or what I've done in the past, which is like, especially like fiends and the like, is an attack gives you a flaw, right? So that you're going to take the damage from it, but it's also a moral wound, you know? So you get, I like using the ones from the demon lords from like out of the abyss or, or you know, where it's like, yeah, you're going you're gonna to get one of these anytime you fight this fiend because it's not just a physical attack. It's a moral one as well. It's attacking your soul, <laughs> your, your core of your being. So like now you have to encourage secrecy and, and the like amongst your friends you, or you have to push them to excess in their vices, something like that. And, I, you know, I think one of the most famous examples of this in D&D &D history is when you look at uh, Ravenloft and Straw. The first time Ravenloft came out as a module, everyone was pretty confident uh, about fighting zombies until you ran into a straw zombie and the yeah. limbs could fight independently once severed. Uh, that was the first example I ever had that yeah, changing your monsters <laughs> can really scare the crap out of your players. <laughs> And it's like the, the trick monster, right? Has a long pedigree in Dungeons and Dragons. Like some of the first, like Troll is a classic example. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're just going to fight this big giant thing. 
wait, why does it keep knitting itself back together? Why can't we hurt it? Yeah. That's well, because there's only a handful of things, fire and acid, of course. Now everybody knows that. But uh, at, some, at one point, nobody did. And that's a, that's a trick. Once you know the trick, you kind of overcome it. But the first few times, yeah. it, it's like, what, what's happening? How does this, wh why? <laughs> and you, the, the reaction you get from your players is really, uh, really great. I, 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 I live for it as a DM, those moments of like, oh, this is new. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I give, I'll give goblins, I almost make wear goblins um, that have goblin shark teeth. They have a second mm. row of teeth that can extend out of their mouth. Yes. I love doing things like that too. Yeah. Because I, I like taking, you get, taking the mundane and making it terrifying um, keeps, keeps everyone interested because eventually you think you know what a troll is. Well, thankfully D&D &D now has like five or six new trolls because yeah. trolls are like, Great, because <laughs> if they eat something, they can't become part of that thing. Right. So you can yeah. make a lot of weird stuff. A lot um, of stuff there. What are some of your favorite monsters? And you're going to show us how to build them in yeah, D&D Beyond. Yeah. So uh, what I what I like to do, and this is sort of like entry level uh, creating your own monster, is to take an existing one and then reskin it somehow. Right. Change just enough of it. A lot of times, just the presentation is all you need to, you, know, you don't even have to change any of the stats, but that's not necessarily what we're looking for here. We want to do something else. So I'm going to take, um, get, share my screen real quick and show you guys how I uh, would do this. How are we looking? Pretty good. All right. Um, so I'm going to take one of my favorite monsters and that is a tiger. And I like using beasts as a base because they're usually really simple. You don't have to worry a lot about, uh, you know, changing a bunch of stuff. It's easier to add on to them. Um, and so as you open up the homebrew uh, monster here, I just had to click collections, create a monster. So I got here. And one of the things I, I absolutely love <laughs> about D&D Beyond is that you don't have to go through and create the whole thing. Right, you can take an existing monster in the database and start from there. And it's good for both like creating something whole cloth or like copying and pasting an existing ability onto what you're using. A lot of times when I create a homebrew monster, I'll have seven or eight tabs open because it's like, all right, I want the language from this spell or the ability from this other monster. So um, it's been a really, really great tool for that. Um, the big thing to note when you're creating your homebrew monster here is this big red button here because this is your, as your save button, this is how you don't say waste a bunch of work whenever you uh, say accidentally close something or make a mistake and uh, you know, lose all of the uh, painstaking hours of player killing goodness you've been working on. I have lost much to not saving as yes. we all have. <laughs> Do not forget have, yeah. to save. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so you get the basic information by expanding this section here. And this is gonna give you a whole bunch of, you know, sort of interfaces, text blocks and the like, and it's gonna let you change basically anything you want about the monster. Uh, and if you're like me and you're like obsessively detailed to make sure that your monsters look like they belong in the monster manual, have a similar language mm -hmm. that the rules of the, the game have, this, is, this was a real boon <laughs> to, uh, to get this. Uh, so we're going to call this, uh, I don't know, Super Tiger or something <laughs> like that, right? Okay. Mega we're, Tiger. <laughs> we're going to make Mega Tiger. <laughs> right. uh, it's going to be large. I, I don't, I, we're going to go huge for this guy. Uh, clearly this is no longer a beast, but a monstrosity. Mm -hmm. um, and given it was created by an evil wizard, we're going to go ahead and give it an alignment as well. Okay. Challenge rating. This is one of those things that you, you either, you either love it or you hate, can't stand it. You know, I have grown to love the challenge rating mm -hmm. because uh, it gives me sort of an idea. It ballparks sort of how difficult the creature is. Um, I also use it when creating a monster because there's that, uh, table in the dmg like way in the back i think it's chapter nine that's like all of the sort of ranges ac damage per round uh, that you get for a monster so uh, if i'm creating something whole cloth i'll use that but we're not we're just gonna not worry about that right now i think <clears throat> so uh, you can adjust the challenge rating if you like but it is uh kind of up to you so right here we have the special traits these are these sort of 
passive abilities that uh, your monster might have. If they've got spell casting, this is where you'll find it. Um, right here we see for the tiger, they've got keen smell, uh, granting them advantage on wisdom perception checks, uh, and as well as pounce. So, uh, What's nice think, about this is it has uh, kind, of, kind of that coding in there that you need to you know, have like the example of a perception popping up. So when you yes. tool tip over things, they'll pop up and, and absolutely and your players or you or any other person who's DMing using monsters you've created uh, because if you publish then other people other DMs can like use this content yeah that's really helpful yeah I actually actually I, I hadn't checked some of my homebrew creations in a while and I got a lot of notifications that was like you cannot share this because it looks too much like something else so it's really fun to like have it sort of the database kind of check it how close does this look to something that's already there is this you know something that you can put out there in the public because it's you know it's your own idea or is it something you're just going to keep for your own group because mm -hmm. it's you know something that you found somewhere else and you just want the stat block um so i really appreciated that and yes you're absolutely right this thing right here these bracketed either condition or skill or spell it, it's just a game changer for me because having that hover tool tip is one of the many reasons why I enjoy using D&D Beyond uh, when I run my games. Uh, so right here, I see that they've got a DC 13 strength saving throw, but I know that I'm gonna raise their strength, uh, which can found down here. I'm gonna go ahead and give them a 20 uh, for this, and then that will allow me to raise this uh, DC right here by, uh, mm -hmm. by two. There's a whole school of thought that says, do I adjust the base math of the monster like do i if i adjust its ability score or its proficiency bonus right can i get the dc there or do i just give it the dc that i want yeah i'm one of those weirdos that likes <laughs> the underlying math <laughs> of the monster to make sense um so that's why i uh, do it that way especially if you are keen if you're at home and on uh learning kind of the language of dnd &D and um the systems in place i think this is really great to adhere to some of these rules yeah. uh, in terms of okay you increased your strength well the dc saving throw now is also tougher um yeah. reading this language is very helpful and you learn very quickly um when you read unearth arcana or you read the books mm. especially when you're designing your own stuff in D, &D beyond mm. you really get a sense of the language and why the language is the way it is yeah yeah very much so, very much so. And it's it's very precise. And I think at the, on first glance, especially coming from like fourth edition, when I remember playing it, it's a lot of technical language, a lot of definitions. You know a burst means mm -hmm. this thing, you know. At first I thought fifth edition has such a natural language to it. Like it, it's, it's almost as if there aren't rules sometimes. But then you start noticing patterns and you start noticing the ways of fra things are phrased. And it's always, or it's very always... Uh, goodness it's almost always the same way or in a very similar way and that is where i started noticing the exception based design because it's like if you can copy that language if you can get a feel for how it uh, sounds and how the rules are presented it's so much easier to start going like well what if this what if that you know what if every time this tiger uh, moves at least 30 feet it's hidden right it's it's something some sort of like shadow uh, ability or something like that mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so if we wanted to do that we might put something like this and uh, because we're putting them in alphabetical order you know as you do uh, and you're gonna go use your bold and italics this might be like shadow prowl you know and um you might say uh, when the mega tiger moves at least 30 feet, it is hidden. That's it. Now, this is no matter what, is the Mega Tiger can move 30 feet and kill you. Well, obviously that d destroys the hidden. Yeah, so if you had attacked, it'd be no, it'd no longer be hidden. And if I was wanting to really like tighten it up and, and to account for all of the uh, conditions, right. you know, this is the difference between making something for yourself versus making something that yeah, you're going to share with others. You know, as intended, however, presenting that to the audience. Uh, yeah, yeah. Somebody else is going to run this and go like, wait, does that mean I can attack and no one knows it? If, you know, right. does that mean? <laughs> 
<laughs> that guy's just, just getting torn to pieces. <laughs> right. They just have the claw marks show up on them. But my intent here is to say that while it is moving, it is moving too quickly for you to really be able to see it. You couldn't cast spells at it. That mm -hmm. raises the question then, how long does this effect last? So then you might say it is hidden uh, until the end of its next turn. And that gives us a better idea of how long this effect lasts. Uh, it means that it primarily I would use something like this to prevent it from being targeted by spells, mm -hmm. you know, so that you cannot, uh, can't see it. Another way to phrase it might, might be that while it is moving or if it moves a certain amount, it treats, uh, it, it, it is treated as if it were in heavy obscurement, right? That's another uh, way to phrase that. So there's a lot of, Sometimes there's a lot of different ways to get the same effect that you're, uh, that you're looking for. Now, um, are we going to move on to actions? Has strength now affected our attacks yeah, or absolutely. also the size? Yes. So the size will increase, uh, I believe it's the damage, uh, I, oh, goodness, I believe it's the base uh, damage dice, but you can also adjust, say, how many damage dice it's used. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and adjust the, uh, the modifiers here real quick. And um, again, this is one of those things where you can either just pick the number that you want. <laughs> you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the underlying math of it. But again, if, you, if it's for others to look at, you want to make sure that you've got a good idea for uh, how the rules presented, how they work. One of the things that uh, you'll find is that monsters don't have their proficiency bonuses listed. And so you have to do some reverse engineering from uh, the stat bonus, you know, mm. and as, then you arrive at your uh, uh, proficiency bonus that they have. So in this case, I'm going to increase these to two dice, which is going to raise this damage by the average amount. So average for D10 is 5.5. Um, so 5.5 times two is going to be 11 plus five is 16. And somebody please let me know if my math is wrong because it very well might be. Uh, <laughs> so 2D8 becomes... 4.5 times 2, that's going to be 9 plus another yeah. 5, 14. And if you need to, uh, I often use a website called Any Dice actually to like yes, kind I of find my dice. averages <laughs> um, and also kind of optimize my characters sometimes mm -hmm. uh, just, just to see like, well, we'll see how effective, effective this build is. I absolutely love uh, Any Dice. So I'm thinking this is a grotesque, tiger made by biomancy and, and all sorts of sorcery. So maybe it has like a giraffe neck and I'm going to give it a 15 foot bite reach. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and raise its claw to a uh, respectable 10 for a huge creature. But then I'm thinking like, I don't want this tiger to get mobbed. I don't want them to, you know, just become a pinata for someone. I want them to be, be a real threat in melee. And so this is one of those things that uh, I kind of found because it's right here on the, on the, uh, the stat block. But you can change this target to be whatever you want. And so I like doing something like three targets Oof. within five feet. Okay. Of each other. So that would be within 10 feet reach as long as there's, say, three of the party who are all standing next to each other, you yeah. can swipe at all of them. And so this is one way to kind of like, you don't have to necessarily do like a multi-attack, although you could. Uh, but this is one way to sort of simulate or, or represent the fact that this tiger is not one to be messed with in melee. And you might just want to send one person into melee with it while the rest pick it off uh, through ranged attacks. Uh, so yes, that is a, that's a trick that I like to <laughs> uh, put on uh, particularly melee monsters that I want to be really strong. <clears throat> so let's see what else we can change about this. So, yeah, especially when you have a whole party, you want everyone to get a little bit of the damage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, this is one of those things that I, I have found this in every edition of d and I have played. <laughs> it's not unique to fifth or, or any of the others. It's all of them is that mo monsters, solo monsters have a tendency to just it gotten <laughs> that the party, especially if they all go before the monster will, yeah, it, you know, it results in this kind of anticlimactic, like that was it. This is supposed to be a terrifying monster, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've I've witnessed many a creature, even though it has a challenge rating based off four players, um, mm-hmm. and it should have been like a. It really, you know, four players can handily kill a lot of things, especially yes. if they're being smart. Despite especially that challenge smart. rating, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, and you know what? Maybe sometimes that's okay. Maybe oh, sometimes yeah, you, totally. you let them have the win, and it ever. I mean, who doesn't want to like completely get the drop on a monster? Yeah, down it in two rounds, and and nobody really gets touched. That's very satisfying for a player. Yeah, and sometimes it's, you know, you get to be surprised as a DM. You're like, oh wow, that, I was not expecting that. Um, but there are times where you want something to uh, to be a bit beefy. So in that case, I'm going to give this one a special reaction, and we're just going to call it. Um, you know, can't touch me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and it is going to be um, when a target or when a creature moves within five feet of the mega tiger, it can move its speed. Oops, there's no apostrophe there, Jim. You can move up to its speed. And there's a more elegant way of phrasing that, I'm sure. Um, a lot of times I will agonize over how things are worded uh, just because I want them to be, um, you know, completely buttoned up. And, and mm-hmm. you know, if I have to show the rule book to my players and get in a big shouting match with them, you know, I want, <laughs> I want it to be as good as it can be. But the intent of this is to say the first person that comes into you know, it, their own reach of the tiger. The tiger can hit you at 15, 20, or 10 feet, you know. But if a player character moves within five feet of the tiger, it can move away from it using its reaction. And maybe I would also say something like, without provoking an attack of opportunity, uh, something like that to make it even nastier, even more difficult to, uh, to come to grips with. Uh, but in this case, I think I'll let that player get their attack in uh, just so that they don't feel too frustrated and quit my game. You know, (laughs) Um, you can put any kind of characteristics description in here. I like putting notes to myself about their tactics. Yeah. What would they do? That kind of thing. What spells do they favor? Um, So this is really in anything, you know, if you want to put flavor text, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Uh, if you find its tracks, what do they look like? You know, how do you know the monsters nearby? Right. Um, that's a, a good place to put this. Um, and then you can check, I haven't seen the legendary or the mythic. That's really cool. Uh, but you can check, is it legendary? That will indicate it on the, uh, on the stat block and then let you put whatever kind of legendary actions there that you want. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to, I'll bypass these. I think this tiger is pretty, uh, Pretty beefy as is. Layer and layer description. Similarly, you can put that text here. And if you create, I do believe if you create a monster from scratch without using a base monster, a lot of this language is already in there. So yeah. You can just fill in the details and the like. <clears throat> now, here's where I'm going to start cheating. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> I don't know that there's really any formula. I'm just going to put armor class 20 and call it natural or maybe unnatural. Uh, and then uh, it's passive perception. Uh, we're going to keep as is. Uh, it's arrogant. It's not really, you know, it expects the, the players to uh, come out after it. I'm not really liking this 37 hit points, though. Yeah. And so it could be a little beef here. Could be a little beef here. Yeah. Let's see here. So, how many of these is it? Yes, indeed, 10. Um, hit point modifier. The other thing is these little tool tips. Mm-hmm. In case you ever become like confused, it's like, what, what am I? Yeah. Well, why doing? does this matter? Yeah. 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 So here we go. This is where your number of hit dice are. And I don't know. What do you think, Todd? How, how <laughs> 50, is 50 too much? <laughs> mm, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of hit dice. Right. Right. Let's yeah, double we're, it. To we're, <laughs> we're looking at Jurassic level. Um, yeah. So it's a beefy tiger. It was maybe there. So uh, it's going to be 10, um, 10 times 5.5 is a number I don't want to just have to multiply off the top of my head. So we'll call it like 60 plus its, um, its hit point modifier here. Right. So that hit point modifier is based on its constitution. 
because we doubled it. I'm gonna go ahead and double that. And then 60 plus 20, we're gonna go ahead and give it 80 hit points. That's its average. Now, of course, one of the things that a dungeon master can do if they want to is give a monster max hit points. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of a classic. I want this thing to survive more than <laughs> two rounds against the party. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, I'm, I'm imagining without this being legendary that this is maybe the pet or a minion of something bigger. So I don't necessarily want to make it too difficult. I don't want them spending a ton of time having to whittle away at, at its hit points. So I think 80 is a good, uh, a good uh, number there. Now, this is where we get fun. Start adding saving throw proficiencies. Uh, I'm going to give this one a constitution saving throw. I don't know if you guys can hear my dog back there, but uh, there she is. And uh, dexterity save. And then an entire uh, array of uh, <laughs> yeah. all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, you can really mess with like how you get attacked in this way. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. So I think given that it's had its... Uh, um, you know, what do you call it? It's, it's, uh, yeah. vitality, it's constitution. It's, it's, you know, it's tough. It's been yeah. used with magic. Immunity, immunity would be cruel. <laughs> oh God. It would be very cruel. You know, that's the thing that for me, like coming from prior editions where I was like, Oh wait, like say dragons don't have immunity to non-magic weapons. What? And then I realized very early on that there's like a lot of characters that are going to be running around without, magic weapons necessarily and so yeah. that immunity to non-magic attacks is really powerful uh resistance though that um that pretty much doubles those average hit points for most uh of the creatures that this is going to fight and that's also, a very that's a, yeah that's a very good point right there yeah, yeah yeah it also lets the characters in the party who do have magic weapons a chance to shine a chance to come in and go like wait i got this you know, don't worry about it. Or uh, the artificer to go, oh, oh, wait, I'm sure I'm glad that I created this magic battle axe yesterday. Or, or the, say, paladin or something to, you know, cast a magic weapon spell on either their own weapon or someone else's to, uh, to let them overcome this particular defense. And I suppose that that kind of touches on just sort of a design philosophy with monsters. It's very easy to create an unbeatable monster. You could go through this list and have it immune to any condition. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of them. And the trick is to find that balance between portraying what you want to portray with a monster. Right. And, and, you know, telling its story as it were without making it so difficult that the party just, just like, this is, I, we're no longer having a good time. This is a slog. We can't beat this thing. Um, and so it's different for every group. But uh, a warning if you are creating your own homebrew is that it's very easy to create an unbeatable monster. Um, so let's see, what do, you, what do you think about condition immunities here? I think it might be immune to being blinded. You know, maybe it's got like supernatural senses or something. Maybe it's immune to uh, being paralyzed or petrified. Uh, this is where it gets ability. really fun for monster design when you can yeah. like oh, these weird edge cases of like its immunities are can be shocking yeah and, and you think about the logic of it like why can this thing maybe not be knocked pro like if it has yeah. like 18 legs it's probably right. not, not going to get knocked over <laughs> no right no probably not or if it does it's it, it happens it, you know it's so quickly that it gets back up that it, it might as well be immune that's another way that you can kind of portray it mm -hmm. i like i think this one maybe i'm going to make it immune to being grappled and my logic here is that perhaps it can go momentarily gelatinous or it can turn itself into sort of a rubbery sort of like mr fantastic or something it can already stretch its neck right uh so immunity to grappled condition um first off it's kind of a nice surprise when say the monk or the barbarian or the whoever comes along to try to uh, grapple the, uh, the beastie. Um, but it's also, it adds another layer of depth to the fight. They think they've got it. Someone finally actually got within five feet of it. <laughs> They're gonna pin it into place so that it can't move away. It can't get that hidden condition. Oh, except it, it slips out of the grapple quite easily, in fact, uh, and is now back on the move, hidden and ready to pounce again. Um, so yeah. Uh, and that's it. We're going to save. I mean, you're, you're ruining my expectation to be able to, to wrestle a tiger. So, right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, right, you know, I'm sorry about that. Now, don't forget to save. So You've save. done a lot of work so far, everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so don't forget to save. Hit that red button, and it'll collapse down the basic information, which will let you. It's a handy way of letting you know you actually saved. You've got the yeah. window open. You saved. It'll close again. So that's a, a good indicator. And then this last little part here, you can add languages. Yeah. All With right. this, maybe it speaks primordial or maybe it speaks primordial. I love animal. I love monsters that can talk to the party. It's why I like manticores. It's why oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I'm gonna give this one common and primordial as well. I, I, I like the inspiration there. And you can just keep adding them all day long. With any just, you're the dungeon master. You don't even have to justify it. You just you're like this is what I wanted. Don't mm-hmm. try to come at me with a justification. Um, you can see what sort of senses it already has by expanding the section. So we see here it's got dark vision. Excuse me. See it's got dark vision, but maybe we also want to give it, say, blind sense. We're just going over here, blind sight. You can add a note to it if you want, like how far out it goes. We're going to go 30 feet. And save. I think I'll be able to see it right there with everything else. And it'll show up on the stat block uh, that way. So if you're oh. casting darkness on this creature, that's not really an issue anymore. It's uh, not an issue anymore. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to make all those warlocks very frustrated. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so it has the uh, stealth and perception here. It looks like it's got a bonus to uh, stealth, which is probably, it probably has expertise, uh, like giving it a double proficiency uh, for it. If we had increased its proficiency, usually the best way to do that is by uh, increasing its CR, then this is where we would want to change that All right there. But uh, I didn't change its CR. However, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to uh, raise this up so that it's got a bit more than it otherwise would. So it's a lot sneakier tiger a now. A little bit sneakier, yeah. Just a little bit more. And I think I'm also going to give it um, expertise in perception. Now, a really fun way thing to do is to have, for me, uh, to have more than one window open. Like, So I have some monsters from d and uh, Beyond uh, pull, pulled up while I'm building a monster and kind of find like picking and choosing something awful you want to combine, right? Ooh, yes. So I've made terrible things like half Kraken, half, you know, Elithid stuff. Um, there's quick ways you can just make that work uh, by just cutting and pasting, you know? Just cutting uh, and pasting. Yeah, or copy and pasting and, yeah. and creating something terrifying. The, you know, it's, it's a fun exercise. Like if you're like, ooh, that's a creepy thing. What if? Yeah. It could do yeah. this, like, well, if I gave the gibbering mouther, you know, madness kind of uh, effect of talking, you gave that to a mega tiger who's talking to you <laughs> about horrible things that, yeah. like, it knows about you, or I don't know, who knows? Yeah, who knows? And and it's not just monsters, right? You can have the homebrew spell tab open yeah. to, to copy-paste uh, spell language. Also There's true. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And thanks to, like, the, the way that it codes with the brackets and conditions, skill, spell yeah, it carries over the, uh, yeah you can get carries over get the tool tip so this is kind of a you know back of the envelope i needed something quick you know in a hurry i want it like this maybe i would take like a screen grab of it uh, and paste it into a google doc that i was using to run uh, right game with um but sometimes you want to go all out and you want something that's like not just a reskinned monster something with you know swapped out uh you know, abilities. You want to create something like whole cloth. So I would like to show you one of my uh, one of my bad boys. Okay. Oh is, God. <laughs> this is Lang the Immortal Chronomancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay. Uh, Lang was meant to challenge a party of about fifth or sixth level five characters, um, and is meant to be a solo monster. And so a lot of uh, Lang's abilities are you know give him either a, uh, a leg up uh on the party when he's the only one around or are meant to like surprise the party like oh i didn't know that would happen <clears throat> and so just kind of looking at him ac 16 that's respectable for a psionic uh, mage type uh, we've got a fly speed of 30 with hover 120 hit points 
We've also got that bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing resistance from non-magical attacks. <clears throat> nice array of uh, saving throws. Probably going to be, uh, you know, probably not going to land a, uh, you know, a, sort of a mental spell on him as befits a psychic chronomancer. Uh, but physically, not a lot going on. Plus two to dex saves, plus one to constitution saves. So you might want to nail them with like fireballs or you know, the like poison type uh, effects. <clears throat> I did give him immunity to stunned because I did not want monks, <laughs> a monk just being able to uh, <laughs> uh, stun lock him, basically. Oh, uh, you're mean. You don't I like know. monks. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, you could still just punch him. Um, and then the frightened and charmed immunities reflect sort of psychic defenses, and things like that. Now, the backstory for Lang is that he is a time traveling, sinister wizard, psychic person, and makes cloned copies of himself that are purpose built for whatever you know like i need to be able to breathe underwater i'm gonna create 50 copies of myself with gills that kind of thing um in addition to being a uh, a psychic and he travels through time looking for a uh, a megalith that is uh you know is sort of the MacGuffin of the campaign <clears throat> as we look down i give him telepathy i did not arrange these in alphabetical order that's a, that's a demerit um so <clears throat> would not want to anyone else but you guys to see this um so it's telepathy i'm telling jeremy crawford right now i know it's a shame take my dnd card away it's all right i'll go play something else uh, <laughs> uh i gave him foresight copied that language uh from the spell foresight can't be surprised has advantage on attack rolls ability checks and saving throws and then i got this uh, this one right here additionally attackers cannot gain advantage when attacking lang they don't have disadvantage they just cannot gain advantage against Lang. And that's an example of that exceptions-based rule system that says, normally you get advantage when you recklessly attack, you're attacking after a guiding bolt, maybe you're using the variant flanking rule. Not against Lang though, you cannot gain advantage against him uh, when making an attack. Nothing about attacking with spells, nothing about uh, you know, other ways to disable or harm him, just when you're attacking. So you hate rogues and you hate monks. That's what Certainly. I'm this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's All gonna right. be a theme as we get deeper into this. <laughs> uh, magic resistance uh, kind of makes sense just because of the magical nature of who he is. <clears throat> and then I have some innate spell casting. I pretty much lifted this from the Mind Flayer. Uh, straight out of the Mind Flayer's block, changed the names, and then went through here and gave him all kinds of either time-themed or psionic-themed spells. They require no components. Excuse me. Uh, so these are kind of meant to simulate just kind of like the different things that he can do. A lot of times I have spells that are less about doing something in combat and more, um, you know, this is what the creature can do. This is what the monster can do like outside of combat. It can send you dreams, right? It can taunt you. It can send nightmares after you, uh, things like that. I love dream, by the way. It's like my favorite NPC monster spell. Um, it's a fun way to have the party interact with the villain without like actually needing to be in their presence. Um, and so I, but I do use the nightmare ability on it sparingly because you can rack up exhaustion <laughs> with it um, or deny them, say their spell refreshes, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so then I come down here to their actions, multi-attack, uh, Lane can make two attacks, one with chrono beam and the other with psychic bolt. And so Chrono Beam is a ranged spell attack, plus six to hit, 120 feet. Although like the Mega Tiger, uh, if there are two targets within five feet of each other that are within that 120 feet, they will both be hit uh, by necrotic damage, which kind of represents the fact that this little portion that gets hit is de-aging. You know, I, I might describe it as like their skin flaking and sort of drying out and get, rotting off or their hair falling out or something like that. You know, maybe it gets wrinkled in this one little spot, uh, something. Okay. <clears throat> Gross. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, right. I initially had it that it actually aged the target. And like, I, you know, you'd roll randomly for how much it aged you. But then I remembered or rather realized that 5th edition doesn't actually have like rules for what happens as you age. 
and I was importing rules from like second edition. Yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> that, that was dropped off, but that was yeah. a big thing. Um, yeah. It kind of made you, when you originally made your characters, like and very concerned about how old you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, you know, and I, I remember having a player once who decided that they were going to be a really old magic user. Like they, they, they're like, I'm going to be like 60 something because they wanted those increases to wisdom and intelligence. And I think then they cast haste on themselves a little one too many times. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> bumped it up to very old. <laughs> uh, so I changed the language on this and just went straight damage. It can hit two uh, creatures if they're next to each other. Um, and besides psychic bolt is a little, is a little nasty. It's a ranged spell attack plus 60 hit range of 60 feet. It targets a single uh, creature. It will take uh, 3d6 plus 5 psychic damage. Then they have to make a DC 16 intelligence saving throw or be incapacitated until the start of their next turn. So let's think about the kinds of creatures or party members who might not like a momentary incapacitation. A barbarian might not like that. No. Drop them out of their rage. No. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, a caster probably isn't going to like this because it's going to drop whatever concentration spell that they have. However, the sting is taken out of it because they still get their turn, right? This is only up until the start of their next turn. It's not like a stun or something where you lose a whole turn. But given sort of strategic use of this kind of attack, um, you can really mess with some of the party. And a theme with Lang is that he targets um, sort of the off-label saving throws. Lots of intelligence saves, lots of charisma saving throws. Um, that was not particularly popular with the party uh, whenever I, <laughs> I threw him at them. Um, let's see what else I have. Steel time, so once a day uh, power. If I was remaking this, I might say once a long rest, just to bring it more in line with the way uh, that uh, fifth edition has its uh, you know, reset timers. And this one, Lang targets one creature that he can see within 30 feet and forces that target to make a uh, DC 16 wisdom saving throw. And basically the way I had this was as long as Lang is making constant is maintaining concentration, that target is slowed and Lang is hasted. Mm -hmm. And that represents like him stealing some of that time. Um, and then if what, you can, what is the CR rating on this guy? This guy is a nightmare. A uh, 13. <laughs> oh was my, my God. Was my ballpark. <laughs> this is definitely a dungeon master's monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I wanted I wanted him to be a threat by himself. I didn't want a, a boss monster that had like a bunch of minions. Right. If he uh, gets smited, you mm -hmm. get smited back. <laughs> right. Exactly. Billy, it's a lot. Of, you know. <laughs> exactly. If you banish him, he banishes you. He's going to banish you back. Yes. Uh, which there's a he's got several ways to banish. Uh, we'll get to them. This next one is one of my favorites. Chronal duplicate. Um, once a day, uh, the a future self of Lang materializes in an unoccupied space within 30 feet of Lang. And then I lifted a lot of this language from Simulacrum. Um, and uh, it's basically a whole other version of Lang shows up with maximum HP. It's a creature. It, mm -hmm. it, it basically, like now you have to fight two of them. But down here, I kind of created a condition that if the party is savvy, if they go, wait, if this one's a future version, and that's how I would describe it, say Lang opens a portal to the future and draws another version of himself into the present, then the party might go, if we kill the present one, won't that get rid of the future one? And lo and behold, uh, if, um, if Lang drops to zero hit points, the duplicate loses all of its hit points and vanishes. So even though there's two of them, you just have to focus on one. And you can, as, long, as long as you can just ignore the other one long enough, you can take out the first one then the whole thing's over. And furthermore, if the duplicate drops to zero and Lang can see it, then Lang has to make a DC 13 charisma saving throw and on a failure, paralyzed until the end of his next turn as he sees himself cut down and has to deal with the fact that uh, one day at some point he will be brought back here and in fact die. And so that is... Um, part of the, my logic there. Lang's a pretty nasty monster, so I wanted However, to have specific weases. Oof, I would admit, if I witnessed that once, Avram would disguise self and stab himself with minor illusion. Um, make himself look like the duplicate mm -hmm. to lock him up. <laughs> to lock him uh, up, yeah. I, I like this because I, well, first off, this is a very avram uh, type villain, um, but with Undead Warlock, there's some really creepy stuff to be done once you hit 10th level with that Unearthed Arcana. You yeah. drop below 
you know, uh, zero hit points, uh, mm-hmm. you explode, yeah. I, and then you're suddenly alive. So it's interesting to think about how you come back. You yeah. come back to one hit point. Exactly. And for Avery, yeah. I could see him teleporting another clone in. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. A great. So that's another a great clone one. just gets, ba-doop, which is very Avery. Long right history of cloning. Um, oh, yeah. But also, if you're really gross, just <laughs> just the blood forming a new body. You oh, know, gosh, like those yeah. old horror films, you know. Yeah. Um, or like or, Fifth Element, where it's like knitting, knitting them back together. Knitting themselves mm-hmm. back together is yeah. pretty fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so moving through the rest real quick. I, I love that image, by the way. Uh, Displace in time is essentially a banish um, that doesn't need to be concentrated on. So it's particularly nasty. Um, but it, at the same time, they can make a saving throw at the end of each of their turns to come back as opposed to banish where you're just like gone for a minute. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of is <laughs> kind of sucks in one way and is better in another. Uh, then he has two reactions that, uh, uh, Oh let's... God, I am. It's all, I'm already terrified of this. I, yeah. <laughs> I remind me never to play in one of your games. <laughs> I'm so scared of this character. Uh, <laughs> uh I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> step between seconds is a reaction and both of you'll notice both of these have recharges. So, um, you know, these are not something that's going to do, uh, every, uh, you know, every round or every time these conditions come up. And this is sort of similar to what we gave the mega tiger, um, except it's a 60 foot teleport. Mm-hmm. If a creature gets within five feet of him. And then rewind is one of those that I understand what I mean with this, but I would not put this in a published or, or publicly available. Product. Right. Yeah. And that is Lang chooses a creature. He can see and forces it to make a DC 16 charisma save on a failure. The effect of its most recent action is reversed. Did that uh, fighter just land a huge crit on Lang? No, I didn't. <laughs> did that, um, you know, did that uh, wizard lock Lang in, in some kind of, uh, you know, spell or something like that? Did it really, you know, try to incapacitate him some way? Maybe not. It's, it's sort of reversed. The intent for me is that the resource is spent, the action is spent, mm-hmm. but the effect of it is negated. Right. Um, and then, of course, it's got to recharge except if we look down here, one of Lang's two legendary actions is to refresh one of the recharge actions or reactions that he has. And I would describe this as like the, the tip that I got from, uh, from someone who was sort of like helping me with this was like, maybe this is a power up move that, that part in like an anime where it's like the big attacks about to happen again. Yeah. You project it to the party. Like, Oh man, he just like refreshed his displace in time. You know, now two of us are going to be, in a, a chronal demi plane, uh, right. timeless <laughs> and incapacitated. Um, and then, of course, I gave myself some tactics, creates duplicates and moves, always moving, steals time on the mightiest warrior, uh, rewinds unless in melee. Then this, steps between this is also a fun way to just kind of chronicle your, your, your DMing, right? You, you save these monsters as you, you know, I wish I had done this personally mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, with my own shows. Just homebrewed them in D and D beyond myself. A lot of it is like in my head, or I make little notes. But to have it there for you just to look at, um, it keeps you fair, it keeps you honest as a DM. Mm-hmm. But also, you have this forever. You yeah. have like this is the monster I made as a DM. Remember when it I is. used this? Maybe yeah. you can do something with this l- later. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great to have a callback and and to have a villain like so well, f- you know, fleshed out. Yeah. Um, and so unique you don't mm-hmm. this is not a character you expect like you're not attacking uh you know an aberrant mind soul sorcerer or something like that right you, right. you don't know what is going on with this dude yeah yeah, yeah. And I, I had inspiration from some third party uh products but you know i when by the time i got my hands on them and sort of worked it over and and massaged them into what i wanted right this was really a creation that i was very proud of and th- this villain turned out to be a recurring villain because when they defeated him uh, it embedded a shard of its conscious into one of the party members i treated that like an intelligent uh, item a sentient item occasionally had to roll ego scores against each other to maintain oh control. yes the old ego really uh really we got fun. some questions in chat real quick yeah, uh cool. one of the first questions was i've been wanting to homebrew a bard cantrip spell called earworm do you think it would be better as a reskin of vicious mockery or as a full spell. I like the idea that a bard gets something stuck in the subject's, the spell's mind that disrupts their focus or imposes disadvantage 
or some other repercussion, I think you should make your own spell. I mean, I, I, you can reskin it, mm-hmm. but I am curious what your worm would do. Yeah. I like kind of maybe uh, an individual bane like effect that gives you, you know, it's distracting. So you, you lose a 1d4. Maybe it's, um, you know, I like it as a almost subclass ability. Earworm is you yeah, know, being the opposite name. of bardic inspiration. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, distracting or maybe it's infectious um, is another thing because it, it can mean two things right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I really like that. And I, I, I agree with you. I think as much as you can try to come up with it on your own and it doesn't have to be polished. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to match the language there. But as you create things that are completely on your own or like borrowing snippets from, from other stuff, you get a feel for like how you write, how you create things. It doesn't need to be like it is in the Monster Mail. That's my own particular obsession. It doesn't have to be yours. <laughs> um, and so it's really, uh, to me, it's the beating heart of Dungeons and Dragons is the ability to just create what you want and what you need. And apart from monsters, I love creating subclasses for my players because they're like, I want this, but I can't have it, or it doesn't really work for me. Let's make a custom one, you know. It's a good habit to get into. Like, so when you're asking that your question, why don't I just reskin it? Well, I mean, I I, I reskin things all the time. Like right now, I'm debating um, using a coin as my <laughs> my eldritch <laughs> weapon, right? Uh, as my my pact of the blade mm-hmm. uh, to do eldritch smite because I think, boy, that's a rough way to go, uh, smiting with a coin yes. by that you throw. Um, so there, reskinning is, is fantastic, especially when you're starting out, but mm-hmm. I would recommend try, try, especially if you're interested in design, making new spells, new monsters, it will excite your players. Your players will not know what you're up to. Um, it organizes your thoughts. Uh, it, it yeah. is, there is a language to D and D that you will slowly assimilate. And honestly, like, uh, to be a dungeon master and to be homebrewing your spells or subclasses and seeing what works and doesn't work. You're, you're now kind of doing two things at once. You're, you're learning design, writing, and how to run a game all at the same time. And you are having willing participants basically play test your stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously I, I run games and we use the regular classes that you see, but yeah, if I was to run a home game, that's a good point. Like I might run a home game um, that was all subclasses. I helped someone redesign just to see if they worked. And then we can make adjustments as we go. And that's a great learning experience because I, I personally myself am very interested in D and D design and tabletop yeah. design. So you always take the leap. Uh, you'll be surprised how hard it is. Or you may be like a fish to water and just understand it. And, and yeah. you won't know until you try. Won't know until you try, yeah. My favorite part about homebrewing is finding a way to like integrate what they call the fluff and the crunch so much. Yeah. You can't really separate it. That, it, that they are one thing. And to sort of like, you know, I know some people, they're, they fall on either side. But to me, like you can't have the one without the other. And being able to, to take something that's purely narrative, that's purely, you know, exist as a, something that you just thought of as flavor or something and go, wait a minute, I can make some kind of game mechanic, some just widget of the game that reinforces the narrative that you're trying to go for, the fiction that you want to portray. And vice versa, you know, what does it look like when, you know, you, you come up with something that's just a mechanical widget? Yeah. Thinking about how it expresses itself in the setting is, is very satisfying. I, I personally make a lot of, um, I recently used a monster actually on a live stream that I had designed a long time ago and, and my players were delighted that I had homebrewed a creature that was so scary and messed with them so bad. Um, cause they didn't know what they were up against. And mm. especially for those that have been playing D and D for a long time, it's kind of a breath of fresh air to run into a monster. You don't understand. Yeah. yeah uh, very much. And it puts your head in, in a really great mindset. And, and that's the whole point of D&D. That's what makes D&D exciting from the get um, is you don't know what's going to happen next. And you, yeah. you never get to play your first game of D&D again. But if you're, if you're a DM that's homebrewing subclasses and homebrewing monsters left and right, well, you're kind of giving that back to people, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and it, and I, you know, it's a great way to learn the game. It's a great thing to do if you if you've already got it down. You know, it's it's just 
it's tomorrow. It's the part I'm going to just keep tripping over my words. It's the part of DMing that is its own game for yourself. Right. And like, I have, I'm, I don't really like to disparage the people who have fun with Dungeons and Dragons by themselves, reading the books, making characters. Oh, I love it. That's all I do all day. <laughs> right. Like it's, it's some great fun. Like the actual play at the table or virtually or physical, that's, you know, where the game happens. But there's so much of it that happens away from the table, especially for dungeon masters that you got to love it. You got to find something to enjoy about it. And if it's hacking part of monster to create some abomination that you send out to your players, then more power to you. I love it. I made Averin Hydra. I made a Hydra of Averins because <laughs> all the clones got left too close together. <laughs> yes. And they suffused. Yes. Not suffused, but they fused together. Oh because my God, yes. If you're that arrogant, um, you must make the most arrogant monster <laughs> that you're even you are ashamed of. I mean, is it like torsos? That are it was out? a Averin Hydra. So it was all Averins, all uh-huh. forming legs. So a full Avon would be a leg, a full Avon, you know, a, a tail. Yes. Um, yes. Torso would be multiple Averns, you know, oh multiple heads of Averin, all screaming all at once, <laughs> all chattering. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, I made an impression. I bet. I bet. And That's that was in disturbing. a secret room that no one could find. Like, they were like, well, what's in this room? Ah, let's open it up. And they opened it up. They're like, no, we'll oh, close God. that door. <laughs> Don't be afraid to make monsters that people are like, let's yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's nothing wrong with the party just running away because they don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> Mr. Jim Davis, where do we find you? You have one of the best channels uh, I've ever encountered. Um, when I got back into D&D, uh, it was instrumental into my my resurgence and, and my love of 5th edition D&D. What is, yeah. what is this channel? Thank you. So we, I can be found over on WebDM. That is our uh, main YouTube channel where we talk about Dungeons and Dragons and all things tabletop RPGs. We're doing a little bit of rebranding in the near future. So don't be uh, confused or surprised if the format changes up a bit. Maybe see some extra videos. Who knows? Um, we have a second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, where our actual plays and live streams and the like are archived. It's been a while since I've been featured on there. <laughs> and hopefully that's going to change soon. Well, you know, it's it's the finding time to dm is usually quite difficult um you also have a patreon where we have a podcast we you know an hour and a half of us just rambling really exploring a topic and uh you know thinking thinking it through and sort of getting into all the nooks and crannies so yeah yeah it is a great show it is a great (laughs) channel um and there's some cool rewards as well if you are a patreon subscriber you get some podcasts and some really good stuff so all right. Well, thank you everyone for watching Todd Talks. That's how, if you're curious how to homebrew your monster, this, I, this was a great walkthrough. It's made me actually more inclined to start doing it pretty much every time. Um, I have a love of strange monsters. I have a love of changing them up. And the, you really made this look super easy. Uh, and then, you know, if it's unique enough, and clearly you made some things that are very unique, uh, you can share that with the community on d d Beyond, post that in the forums and get feedback and uh, just be part of the d d Beyond community. So uh, it can be a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. And it's a good way to organize your brain before you get ready for the session. Yes. Um, and, and thank you everyone for watching. Thank you so much for your questions. Have a great day.